We've got some great guests coming up and let me introduce you uh, to one of the first of them in this next session and that's Alison Murray. Now one of the things that if you are looking after someone who has dementia and you're considering care, um, it's something that really worries you doesn't it? Um, I know we've, I've been there <laughs> um, and obviously you think nobody can look after your loved ones as well as you can so it's a really difficult one. Well Alison is head of inspection uh, in London and takes the lead for dementia care within the Care Quality Commission's Adult Social Care Directorate and she's now going to tell us what good care looks like. Over to you Alison. Thanks very much, Ali. And just to say, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I started off my career very early on, perhaps even before the days of Brace, uh, working at Manor Park Hospital with Gordon Wilcock and the brilliant team there. And I think it's fair to say that they set the future direction of my career. I was truly inspired by the work that they were doing. So what I'm going to do, and next slide, please. What I'm going to do today is just talk you through um, some of the challenges that COVID and the pandemic has posed for CQC, for the adult social care sector, and particularly for people living with dementia. I'm going to focus on some good practice examples, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some key issues moving forward. So next slide, please. And I think it's important to set out that actually our role and purpose didn't change through the beginning of the pandemic but what it did do like many other people within the sector is it forced us to adapt how we work so we could support providers and allow them to focus on the emergency so although back in march we stopped doing routine inspections we actually never stopped regulating because we knew it was important to you know, to, to still be a visible presence within the sector and what we did was we focused our work very much on contacting providers and partner agencies, checking how it was for them, gathering, analysing information, developing some new monitoring tools to help us do this, and also importantly, sharing the learning that we picked up and we'd also learned from the sector. So next slide, please. And what became very apparent early on in the pandemic were was that there were very specific challenges for the adult social care sector. And when you take into account that within your average care home for older people, we're talking about 80% of the people who live there will either have a diagnosis of dementia or be living with significant cognitive impairment. So all of these challenges that we faced actually were played out in spades for people living with dementia. And for me, uh, I was taken off my day job as head of inspection back at the end of February. So since then, I've been working um, solely on the COVID pandemic and supporting the adult social care response. What was an absolute eye opener for me was the sheer lack of understanding about the scale and scope of adult social care provision. The focus initially was very much on the NHS. And you know, those of us who work in the sector will know that at the very beginning of the pandemic, it was really, really difficult to get clinical support for care homes. And that played out very much for people living with dementia and some really big challenges around visiting, around testing. The visiting conversations are still ongoing. And I know that um, there's been a lot of interest in the media over the past couple of days around how as a, as a system we can support visiting to care homes because we know just how important, how crucial it is to people um, who are living with dementia and also to their family members. Um, I know that it's very much on the minister's radar as well. So if we move on to the next slide, please. But what I want to absolutely do is through this talk to highlight some of the amazing work that staff who work in the adult social care sector and who work in our dementia care homes have been doing to address those challenges that have been thrust upon them. We have seen some fantastic practice and I'm really keen that we don't lose that 
I think all of us get frustrated that the media tends to pick up on the bad news stories, the negative stuff, whereas actually the vast majority of providers are doing a really fantastic job in very difficult circumstances. So next slide, please. And as an organization, CQC were really keen to pick up on this good practice. So what we did was we put a call out to all care home providers and we asked them to send in some examples of what they were doing to respond to the pandemic in terms of innovation and inspiration. And um, the link that you've got on the slide here, which will be shared with you later, takes you direct to a section on our website where we've got some really good examples of just um, none of these things are, are earth shattering, but some really good practice, little ideas that care providers have done to make life easier for people who are using their services and also people living with dementia. Um, and yeah, there may just be some little nuggets that you can pick up from there and take back to your services. So next slide, please. What have we learned from all of this so far? Well, none of it is rocket science. The things that have come across as being really important is around information sharing and the voice of people using services. Now, this is what one of the things that we particularly in CQC have learned very much that the support conversations that we put in place at the very beginning of the pandemic, we were talking to care home managers, we were talking to care home staff, but what we weren't able to do and set up at pace, we put in place systems to talk to people using services and pick up their experiences. And that was particularly difficult when we weren't physically going out and doing inspections. So we've learned from that and moving forward, um, we're, we've amended our ways of working. So that, you know, yes, we're back inspecting again now, but also we're looking at remote ways that we can gather the voice of people using services through you know, Zoom chats, facilitated sessions, etc. Another thing that's come across very loud is around local, the importance of local systems. And, you know, we've been saying this for absolutely years in our national reports. And what's been really clear during this pandemic is that where local systems were already working to, well together, where there was good communication between adult social care and health partners, actually, they were able to, to step up and respond in a really positive way to meeting people's needs. Those areas where they didn't have that level of local working together sort of as established practice struggled more. The other thing is, again, not a surprise, transparency promotes learning. We really do need to all talk with each other to be able to stand up and to say, you know, I'm not sure what to do here or I'm really struggling with this. Does anybody else have the answer? So next slide, please. And to pick up on more of that good practice work, um, CQC are each month publishing what we're calling our COVID insight reports. We published issue number four back in September, and that looked generally at infection prevention and control within health and social care. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. We can just move on to the next slide, please. So what we and also the Department of Health and Social Care were very, very keen to do was to try and address that, that balance around the fact that people were only picking up on the negative stories around adult social care, and also to highlight that infection prevention and control is one of the single most important things that care services can do to keep people using their services and their staff safe from COVID infection. So what we did was at PACE, we devised an inspection prevention and control tool that we could use to help our inspectors go out to services and very swiftly use using observational practice, work out what services were doing well around IPC and where people were struggling. 
So we pulled together a sample of around about 300 care homes where we reckoned from all of our data that actually they were probably doing things pretty well out there. And it was a huge relief to me when it turns out that actually 90, uh, 298 of those care homes that we inspected, thinking that they were good, actually were really good. There were only two of them where we found concerns and had to extend the, the, the inspection to something else. Um, so we got more than 90% assurance across all of the elements that we were looking at, which is a fantastic good news story. Um, I'm in the middle of putting the final tweaks to a report that we're going to be putting out in November that's going to form part of our a part of our insight reports but also provide a lot more detail in the background around those good practice examples that we saw. So next slide please. And this just sets out some of the good practice examples that we saw. Um, you know, really lovely stuff and these actually um, when I went through the report these are all from um, services providing dementia care so thank you next slide and just to very swiftly drill down a little bit um, we also, although we use the, that tool in um, 300 good practice care homes, we also started using it in, um, in services where we thought where, where we'd had risk indicated. And the positive thing from this was that even in those services that we thought were the highest risk, we still found that actually they were implementing IPC practices really pretty well. So next slide, please. And the areas, yes, um, the areas where we didn't see quite such good practice were largely focused around two areas. One of them was around staff using PPE, um, personal protective equipment. And the, the other one was around sort of the quality of audit and oversight of IP systems, you know, managers going in and making sure that their staff were doing what they were supposed to be doing. And the reason that we were very keen to flag this up in our September report and why I'm flagging it up now is that actually these are things that can be really swiftly fixed. And if they're swiftly fixed, then they can have a really big impact on the care that people receive and on all of our efforts to keep people safe in, from infection in care homes. So next slide, please. The other thing that I wanted to flag up is one of the things that we also learned through the initial work that we did was to highlight some concerns around um, advanced care planning and including do not attempt resuscitation decisions. There was a very nasty period where some areas made blanket decisions around people particularly living with dementia and uh, blanket orders that really didn't take into account people's personal circumstances or talk to people about their wishes and their family's wishes. So in April, we issued a joint statement with the British Medical Association, the CPA and the Royal College of General Practitioners. And on the back of that, the department has asked us to do a particular piece of work looking at advanced care planning in care services. We're scoping out this work at the moment, um, but we're going to be publishing a report later on this year and a final report back in 2020, later on in 2021. So next slide, please. And also, to highlight um, one of the other reports that we've just published, our annual state of care in health and social care. Um, it's on our website, there's a link to it just there, and it's worth a read. So if you wouldn't mind going on to the next slide, please. This is the overview of our findings. Again, I think that actually none of our findings were rocket science, but 
it's worth re-emphasizing them and hopefully by re-emphasizing them and sharing the, the find, our findings, hopefully we'll be able to apply joint pressure to the system to help address some of the challenges, particularly in adult social care. So next slide, please. If you want to stay up to date with the work that we're doing, there are lots of ways to do that, which I've got listed on this slide, which again will be shared with you. Just to say as well that you don't have to be a provider to sign up for our provider bulletin. Anybody can do that, it gets sent out every month, um, and it includes blogs from Kate Taroni, our Chief Inspector, and lots of links through to other agencies and good practice guidance that's out there. And also to say that on the um, one of the earlier slides that, that again you'll get a a link through to later on, we take you through directly to the infection prevention control tool that CQC have devised. We've published it on our website and if you're a provider out there, please feel absolutely free to use it for your own audits. It's out there to be used and shared. So thank you very much. And thank you very much indeed to you, Alison Murray, as well. It's really interesting to hear what you have to say, the complexity of all the decisions that have to be made, and perhaps give us all a little bit of understanding when we've seen some of the headlines as to what is going on uh, behind the scenes and what is done to try and protect those who are in care. So very much appreciate that. Thank you very much indeed for joining us.